Welcome back to another episode of the highlight videos from the three questions on educators that inspire series. And in this week's episode, we are going to focus on the administrators. And one of the reasons that I combined the teacher question and the administrator question is to show how interconnected they are that some of our best administrators from our past exude the qualities of some of the best teachers. And I think that's a really important connection that we actually make in education. Cause a lot of times we say things like, Oh, that's, you know, that's why you make the big bucks. And I think it's kind of a condescending thing that we say to people that are on our team. And I know that not all administrators are amazing leaders. And uh, some of our best leaders in our schools are, are teachers. And I, I know that leadership and administration is not always synonymous, but I think we always have to remember that, we are on the same team, we're supporting one another. And as you listen to these stories about from some of the highlights from this year's podcast, you'll hear um, educators talk about administrators that had a really big impact on them. And it's a very similar to how many teachers have, you know, have made an impact on students. And I can share this from a place of experience. Um, some of the best experience I've had were for administrators I work for that connected with me that saw things in me that honestly I didn't see in myself. And I think that to me is a, a theme you'll see over and over again when you actually hear some of these videos is really how they bring out the best in us. And that's what we expect from our teachers and definitely we should expect the same from our administrators. So I hope you enjoy this compilation video of some of the highlights from uh, the three questions series. Uh, I know I appreciated having these conversations. I love learning and you know thinking about how can I implement some of these things that administrators were remembered for uh, in my own practice. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Now I'm going to take like a backdoor approach to this because a lot of times in leadership, we elevate those examples that have just been amazing for us, which rightfully so. However, sometimes I believe those non-examples can just prove to inspire and elevate you to ask yourself, what if I had the opportunity and the resources, the wherewithal and the bandwidth to be the quintessential administrator, who would I be and why? And it's because I have lived through as a teacher, I taught third and fourth grade for five years. And at that school, I had two administrators who believed strongly in micromanaging, who truly mm -hmm. believed that their thumb had to be on every decision that happened within that building. And they also believed in a one size fits all, whether that meant a teacher reprimand or whether that meant a program or whether that meant student discipline. And so when you experience those things and you see the impact, not only on you, but you see it on your colleagues. And you know that they have amazing and wonderful ideas, but that it's not going to benefit anybody because it's not going to get through the main office. Or you see children who you know the last thing they need to do is be suspended and you elevate that concern for sending that child back home and, and still they do it. Or you have these amazing ideas of collaboration and community for your, for your children. And with some tweaking and understanding from your administrator, you can make positive change happen academically and emotionally and, and physically for your children and it just doesn't happen, you then land in a position where you say, where can I position myself to be the type of administrator who does not even have an open door policy, but an open hallway policy, who understands that just as much as, as students need individual education plans, teachers need individual professional development plans because we all come with different skill sets. So I will say that the, the administrators that did not think outside the box, that did not lead um, with, with the sort of understanding that we all are, as learners are in different places. They inspired me to, when I got into that seat, when I got into that school, to be that administrator who was going to be able to shatter the status quo, to be able to leverage the necessary conversations with my superintendent, to have some type of permission to innovate, permission to sort of take tradition and turn it on its head in a way that the community desperately needed. And I'm honestly grateful for every single one of those experiences mm -hmm. because they're etched into the fabric of the administrator that I was. And there's like, there's two big things for me when I'm listening to this story and how you're actually explaining it to me 
is that like, I, I would say as a minister, I think I'm very comfortable saying this. I had an ego and I, I would say, I don't know you that well enough. You probably had an ego too. And the thing is, is that it's okay to have an ego, but understanding that you are limited in your ability to move people to go and do incredible things. If you only limit it to yourself. And I think when you micromanage it, and so I felt like, Hey, the, the, the more that I can actually really empower people and really bring them into the fold, I'm going to do better. Right. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, like I want to, like, I want to do really well too. And I think that like ego is not a bad thing unless you use it in a bad way. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that to me is like, as I listen to you, the other thing that I think is really powerful. And I say this all the time is that to the teachers that are listening and thinking, you know, like, I don't want to be a principal because I don't want to do that stuff. I'm like, you don't have to do that stuff. You're the principal. <laughs> you can kind of do what you want. Like, that's the beauty of the job, right? Like you have. Yeah. And so I think to me, I always ask the question, like, would you want to be a student in your own classroom? But I also think, would you want to be a teacher on your own staff? And how do you create that? And you embody that in the sense that you're saying, look, I didn't like this stuff. So I'm going to make sure that I don't put teachers through that. And I think that's, I think that's the disconnect is that if you really want change, go do it, like go be that person as opposed to just complain. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. And I, and you're like the embodiment of that too. Right. I love, I actually, I'm not gonna lie. I was surprised by your answer, but oh, it, well, it, it also good. makes a lot of sense. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean? It's like, no, I hate that. So I'm going to go do something different. But in anticipation of having this conversation mm -hmm. with you, George, I was thinking about it. And I do have to give a shout out to my first principal. So in my first teaching position was in a school district in the Grand Rapids area. And my principal left that school to mm -hmm. open a charter school two hours north of where we lived. And I said, my husband and I, we were newly married. We wanted to move away from our community and kind of branch out on our mm -hmm. own two hours away. And I asked her if I could have a job. And she said, yes. So I helped open that charter school with her and, yeah. and I was there for 14 years and we grew from, we had grades K through six. When we first opened in the year 2000, we had about 300 students. And when I left in 2014, we had preschool through 12th grade and wow. we had 1300 students. It was just a remarkable experience. And the one thing that she taught me is that tradition and normal is like it's like a rubber band mm -hmm. and if and george just to speak to you as an advocate of innovation mm -hmm. that if we want to do things differently like we had multi-age classrooms we team taught we had project-based learning yep. um we had william glasser's choice theory as a foundational philosophy for our school so there are so many things that were you know different or innovative that right. we were doing and so we had to continually push against this rubber band mm -hmm. because it always wants to snap us back to right. normal. And you can't ever take that tension off or that pressure off because before you know it, one thing's going to go away and then another thing's going to go away. And then, you know, what are we offering our students as an alternate to a traditional education? So I think that was um, just having the courage mm -hmm. and um, having the wherewithal, I guess, for lack of a better term, to keep pressure on that rubber band so that we don't snap back to normal and we keep a focus on, you know, what, what can we do to serve our students in their learning better? Well, and that's one of my favorite quotes. This is not mine. It's just an anonymous quote is tradition is peer pressure from dead people. Mm -hmm. that's a great quote. <laughs> that is a great quote. Hey, <laughs> I love that one. So the, I think that idea is, I think the, the mix up with this is that you're saying like, I don't, no one saying tradition is bad, right? No. And I think that's one of the well, misconceptions. It's if it, it doing something because you've always done it is not a good reason, right? right so there's some traditional right. practices that are great. And I think that you can continue to use them for some kids. Some kids need, you know, different, diff, different elements. And I think pushing that and like one of the misconceptions that I hear often in education and I think that's such a great lesson is that, oh, parents, you know, just they don't want school to change. They want it the way it is for their, it was for them. I'm like, that's not true at all. Parents want what's best for their children. But if they only know 
their experience, they by default think it's the best. But when reality, if you can show them something better, even through experience, right? Like we actually had a parent blogging night where parents are blogging and they walked out and they're like, this is so much better than when I was a kid. And we're like, yeah, we got them. That's it. Cause they saw right. that power of it too. So like, it's not saying tradition is bad. It's not saying new stuff is good. It's finding what's best. And sometimes it's new. Sometimes it's traditional, but I think, you know, you had your focus in the right place and that's, you know, and kudos to you and that administrator. What was the administrator's name? You, you never even said it. Kane Mentley. <laughs> so she is currently the superintendent of Natick, where I was a principal, and she went to Boston College two years before I did. And, and when I joined, she kind of was there to guide me through it. Anna Nolan, and she was somebody who I looked at as just, she was a principal at the time when I was a principal in Natick, and she was just really intelligent, really smart. And she was an administrator at a different level than I was. She was in middle school and looking to go into central office. And I was an elementary principal. And she was incredibly blunt. Like if there was something I didn't do well, she let me know. So one of the things that I started to, when I went through the, the dissertation process at Boston College and went through the superintendent's course, she said, well, the one thing you don't have, I mean, she, this is how she was saying, right. one thing you don't have, you've never worked in a middle or a high school. Start coming with me and do walkthroughs at different mm-hmm. levels. So she would let me do, you know, walkthroughs in, in middle school. And then when she was the assistant superintendent at the high school. So she was very uh, giving in her time and to, to training others. And that was something that I always took with me, that she was willing to do that uh, for me as a newer administrator. And what it allowed me to do is build up that gap where I wasn't similar to what you said. You have to build up our strengths. I had some really mm-hmm. good strengths being an elementary principal for a long time, but where I didn't have the, the leadership capacity was in the high school and mm. was in um, some of the upper middle schools. So she took me with her mm. and said, what did you see? What did you see? Tell me how this worked out. What would you give advice to that teacher? It doesn't matter. You never taught high school. You can tell them right. how to become a better educator. And she was really somebody who um, helped me along um, in, that, in, in that state. And that essentially led me to going into central office um, after my time in Natick. Yeah. And like, actually, I, I'm pretty sure that I've connected with Anna Nolan and I know some people mm-hmm. in Natick. So first of all, shout out Anna Nolan. So, so uh, uh, this is my second school district that I've been teaching mm-hmm. and in my first district. Um, it wasn't really the most positive experience. And this district has really just changed the way I taught. And it has to be um, Don Labonte, who um, at some point um, called me into his office and said, oh, you know, um, there's this Marzano Institute um, workshop going on and I can send two teachers. Would you be, mm. and I thought about you and would you like to be one of them? And I was like, yes, yes, that'd be great. You know, not really knowing much about um, anything at all about the art and science of teaching or anything like that. But the second I got in there mm. and started um, hearing um the ideas and the philosophies being put forward in terms of of instruction, I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. This is what I believe in Mm. and um, my vision for my classroom. And somehow um, this administrator who we really did connect on (laughs) different um, avenues. He actually, um, when I applied for the job, he saw my email address back at the time was um, Mike Muhammad at davidboy.com and he loves David Bowie too. And I don't oh. want to say that's the reason I got the job, but you know, it's one of the ways we were able to connect we're outside of the classroom. But for him, as someone who I didn't see as someone who was always in my classroom watching me teach, that he actually understood this about me and pushed me and let me know that this method of instruction that I was trying out was good and mm-hmm. something to aspire for towards um, was really encouraging. Like, and I'm sure people have had, you know, because we, we like when we talk, we're always talking about the things that are, are great. And I think part of the reason that I do this is not only um, to, you know, share these stories, I think of really inspiring men, but hopefully I know a lot of administrators listen to this as well. But I know I've, I've, you know, maybe seen and felt the opposite. And I hope, you know, I've tried my best. And I'm sure at some point I was that to somebody where, you know, they didn't felt that they were recognized for their strengths. They didn't feel that they're recognized. And I think, you know, the, the thing that we do in teaching and the thing that we do in leadership um, that is really synchronous with one another is that the the job is about elevating. It's about lifting people up, right? And I think sometimes um, because of the minutia, minutia of the work, we can sometimes get lost 
in that and forget like we're really serving people. So is it Don? Is it Don Labonte? Don Labonte. And he is he not? Is he still there? No, he's not there. He's been gone for a few years now. Like I recognize the name. So Don, yeah. if you're yeah. listening. Sure, I would say it's uh, Dr. Steve Humphrey. Um, he was superintendent I had back in early 2000s. And he really was someone that saw something in me and in a lot of um, people that were moving into from going from teacher leadership to either department chair positions or you know, eventually uh, school or district administration. And he just had a knack for like seeing talent and cultivating it. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing was great about him because he tr- always created opportunities for people to um, test the waters that were safe, right? So all these like kind of quasi administrative opportunities that weren't full, full admin, like land administrator, but giving you leadership opportunities so you could grow mm-hmm. and it was safe to grow doing so. And it probably, w- if it wasn't his for his leadership, um, I probably would have never started going in the direction of being in leadership and admin. And it's, it's great because he almost has like, you know, I know you're, you're a basketball fan. Yep. You're familiar with like coaching trees. Yeah. Like he literally has like this admin tree. I love where that. Like people that worked under him at some point in time have gone on to be very successful. Um, so he had, you know, very, very, you know, good guys, um, very honest, had a lot of good conversations with him just about the realities of, of leadership and administration and, mm-hmm. and, and what that means and, and moving forward. So he's definitely someone that, that comes to mind right away. And that, that's like the, you know, the, yeah, you did, you, as when you were talking about that, that's the first thing I th- was thinking about, right? Like the, you know, the coaching lineage, all the people that are inspired by uh, that too. And it's kind of, I, I think a lot of people see that the notion of like leaders don't create more followers. They create leaders as like a cliche almost, but it, it's actually quite true. Right. And you think about just that, that, that idea that I, I think probably sometimes, and I I've had this experience uh, with some of my administrators. It's not that they just kind of bring out talent to you. So they sometimes make you realize stuff you don't know about yourself. Right. Like they see that thing. And I think part of it is kind of when you, always around yourself, right? When you're always kind of by yourself, uh, you don't see it. And sometimes it takes an outsider perspective to kind of point it out and then help harness that. So I, I absolutely love that. So I will say, I will say that the principal, um, when I was at the last school I was at, that principal was just a remarkable leader to me mm-hmm. because she was always very solution oriented, but she always kind of brought us in to help solve the problem. And I'll never forget one time I went to her and this was like, I was the only person on campus that was willing to try and troubleshoot the technology. That's kind of how I, you know, I was mm-hmm. the ed tech person. Right. And so I would help with, you know, okay, oh, I can anything, help update Anything with electricity. <laughs> anything with electricity. Anything with electricity. Go ask Lainey. And so, um, so out of frustration, to, one day I just went into her office and I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm doing almost full two mm-hmm. full-time jobs. Right. I am a full-time teacher and I'm doing this. And she goes, all right, what's your proposal? Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, you can't, you don't come to me with a problem without at least having a thought about what you want to do to fix this. Like, I need your help with this. I don't have the answer. And that, that was like a really important shift for me to have this leader say, I don't have all the answers. You have to help me with this. And she was really empowering me. And then I went back and I thought about it and I'm like, all right, well, here's what I need. This is what I need some release time to do this. I'm not ready to leave the classroom and I, I need some time to do this. And so we came up with a plan and it worked really, really well. So the best thing about, um, the best thing about that process is, and I think that's so important because we want our kids to be able to, you know, identify their problems, which you did, and then, you know, pose solutions. It doesn't mean that they're on their own. We work through that, but what that does is let's say, you get a new principal or you work with someone else the, that principal has instilled in you the ability to, to solve some of your own problems. Do you know what I mean? And actually come with solutions so that, cause you know, I have heard of people having, you know, principals that wouldn't do that. Wouldn't even like give you an option and you kind of got to figure it out on your own. So, Hey, what's the, can you, is it okay to name that person? Like, Oh yeah. That was Monique von Zebrock. Okay. And so yeah. What's so. what's the name? Can you say shout out to that person? Because then they get the special. 
She's gotten married since then, so I'm I'm still using the name I know her by. Um, you gotta say it. So shout out to say. It. Shout out to Monique von Zebrock. <laughs> so I think my first principal um, in Massachusetts, Dan Gudekanst, he's now a superintendent in Massachusetts, but he had this like steady energy to him where he was just very consistent and fair and kind. And he was interested in everything that people had to say, like one of those people that is just really listening. And he, he came into classrooms so frequently, like as a student, as a student teacher, I just hadn't seen a principal, especially of like a large high school, be so mm -hmm. present in classrooms and so supportive to new staff. Um, I really felt like he was invested in all aspects of what was happening in the school district and, um, you know, highly intelligent, but also just like very easy to talk to, you know, mm -hmm. and as somebody that's just coming out of college, who's like teaching for the first time, you know, you're very nervous. And um, I think when you realize that, um, you know, your principal is really invested in what's going on with the students and also like cares about you know, the poetry lesson that you're teaching that day. Right. And it's like asking right. meaningful questions and just popping in to see the kids and like watching someone interact with students. I don't know, it just really made a huge impression on me, this idea of, um, you know, really listening to people, showing up and being present in that moment in whatever exchange, whether it was like me as a new teacher or watching him with the students or veteran staff, mm -hmm. the way that he would lead meetings. He had like such a kind of quiet composure to him that I really admired and that has stuck with me for sure. And that that's like, you know, there is always this kind of mis misconception about high school that, you know, we don't have time to connect with kids because there's so many kids. But I think it's imp like I think it's as important as is the elementary level. It's harder to do because you do have more kids, but it's it's no less important. I think that's I think the more the if you if you really think about it, we, we always talk about kids losing interest as they get older. But also we lose relationships as we get older. So there's, I, I kind of believe there's a correlation between that, right? If you don't feel there's people that are invested in you, like an elementary teacher that has you all day, you're going to feel invested in. But then a teacher that doesn't maybe know your name, then of course you're going to lose interest, right? Whereas, you know, when I got to college level, I'd be like one kid out of 500 and look up my marks based on my number, right? And then guess what happens? I don't show up to that class, right? I only show up when I have to. And I think that that's, so that's really awesome. So how do you, how do you say his last name? Cause I gotta, I gotta hit the shout out button for him. It's uh, Gudekanst. Gudekanst. So yeah. shout out if you're listening. <laughs> Dr. Gudekanst. Yep. Dr. Dan Gudekanst. All right. Immediately. You know, and it's, it's hard to say this. Can I say two? Because they Absolutely. both have two different aspects. So um, my first administrator that I say was like amazing is um, Dr. Kane. She was my principal at Cumberland Road Elementary. I was actually an instru instructional coach when I was there at Cumberland Road. But when you talk about transparency, mm -hmm. that was her. She was transparent about every aspect of the school. And she wanted to, she saw actually the leadership quality in me. I had never thought about being a principal. She came to me and was like, I think you'd be a really good principal. And I'm like, mm, maybe not. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, you should. Like, I see it in you. So as she saw that in me, she like unknowingly kind of built me for that, that role. Mm -hmm. She brought me in. She gave me um, access to um, teacher uh, evaluations, access to um, meetings and budgets. And she just taught me a lot of things. So you talk about just being able to be transparent and to learn and not really know that you're learning all these things because it's really preparing you for something that she saw in me amazing she is by far but then the other part of her is that she's human right mm -hmm. um she has this aspect to be able to show how much she loves like a lot of times administrators are very stern and a very um it's very hard to connect but she wears her heart on her sleeve and um she's very supportive and she's able to empathize with her with her staff and with her kids and um that's one of the things that I just, I just loved about her. And I loved working with her. She's amazing. Like, I wonder, somebody said this to me that, you know, they said, and it was yesterday, and I, I've, I've been thinking about it all day, because they said, you know, you kind of have this certain style where you're, you know, you're very emotional. You're mm -hmm. very, and I, I don't know how to be anything else, right? And I think, yeah. and really, I think there's some people that have that aspect to them. But I, but you also can tell when someone's doing that, and it's like, not like legit. Too, yeah right? like not genuine yeah yeah and i like you know and I'm, I'm a big believer like if that's not you don't like if that's not how you are don't 
fake it because that's going to cause you more issues. And exactly. So I, but I, I, I do think sometimes we repress those things because we feel like, hey, if I'm like seen as having like a weakness or something, or I'm struggling with something mm-hmm. that actually makes me look worse. But I found that people connected with me, with me more when they saw that yeah. I was like, hey, I'm also struggling with this stuff right now too, right? It's not, yes. it's not just you. So yes. you, you said there's two, who's the other one? The other one is um, Mr. Hatch, and that this is that this is the principal that I was just um, assistant principal under. Um, when you talk about energy, energy trans transforms your building hands mm-hmm. down. And I've, I've I saw it with him. He brings in an energy that never ends. He is nonstop. He's on it. He's in classrooms. He's all over the building, and he, everyone in the building feeds off of his energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you talk about creating a space where, you know, you know that you're the catalyst for what type of culture you're trying to create, he's got that hands down. And I love that about him. I love it about him. It's like, it's like talking Jordan one energy <laughs> yes. that we just had. Like I'm like <laughs> jacked up talking about exactly. this. Stuff, right? I love it. I love <laughs> it. So energy, transparency. There you go. Love it. Love it. <laughs>